Hello, um, welcome to this Royal College of Surgeons of England webinar on parenthood for surgeons during the pandemic. Um, we've got a lovely audience and do tell your friends because this will be available uh, on the Royal College of Surgeons of England website archive afterwards. So um, please, you can um, let everyone know who couldn't be with us tonight. So uh, we're going to start by introducing our panel. We've got a fantastic panel, um, very diverse today. Um, I'm going to start um, with me. Um, can I have my first slide, please? Um, just some housekeeping uh, information. Um, so I'm an orthopaedic surgeon at Eastbourne. I'm a council member of the Royal College of Surgeons of England and deputy director for the Centre for Perioperative Care. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm a mother of four and I actually guarantee I've had the best lockdown of anyone because I'm shielding. So I'm at home with my fantastic children who are all doing school and work and home um, and, and university from home. Uh, in fact, that was our 25th wedding anniversary um, and it's been delightful. My son cooked me lunch today. Um, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the last uh, 20 something years. I had three children as a registrar and one as a consultant. Um, my husband's a nurse, so he dropped his hours to bring up the children. Um, uh, with teenagers, it's actually quite handy to live in town near bus stops because you have to be there really to listen to them rather than it being organising childcare quite so much. It's a different, different phase. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, so that was one of the last school runs we did by car and then um, we persuaded everyone to cycle to school and um, you know we can talk in a different time about sustainability and cycling but teenagers need your presence and transport to collect them after parties and that sort of thing um, and and we've had a little bit of that lately as lockdowns reduced um, but it's it's a fantastic time in in one's life next slide please um, so I actually had two miscarriages. Um, I'm mentioning that now because the miscarriage rate is 20%. One in five pregnancies um, don't um, survive. And people feel like they blame themselves. Um, and this is something that people need to know about more, I feel, because it, things don't always go according to plan. Um, I was pregnant before European Working Time Directive. Um, the biggest difference for me was the CPOD report that came out in 1999 about nighttime operating. And immediately after that, operating would only be life or limb threatening at night. That came out during my third pregnancy and it made a huge difference when I came back from that because now you operate with a team and surgery isn't about being heroic and individual and trying to be perfect all the time. It's about working with the team and being very, very focused during the operation and using the skills of, of your team. Now, um, and that's um, a picture of the um, breastfeeding. Uh, if you want to express breast milk, you can to keep your supply up. Just people don't know about it, so I thought I'd fling that in there. We've got lots of information on parenthood on the rcseng.ac.uk forward slash career um, bit of the website. Now, it ought to be an awful lot better two, two decades later. And unfortunately, it isn't as good as it should be, uh, particularly with long shifts and with commuting and with people who are in training um, needing to get their training experience in. Now, I actually went part time five years ago down to nine PAs um, when my mother got dementia. Uh, she's doing fine now <laughs> and my trust was great. But actually, it's much easier for me to, to go part time than for some um, people um, juggling with their training and working less than full time. So um, that's again, something that needs to be better than it is, but it's an option that's available to everybody. So families come in all shapes and sizes. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, life happens um, and you just have to kind of grab it and get on with it. Um, it. You can't put things on hold and then have babies or you can't, think you'll work really hard and then look after them afterwards. It's, it's, it has to be boxing and coxing and different priorities at different, different times of the day or week. Um, and unless we get these, get families through the phase, particularly when surgical training coincides with having small families, we'll never get the best surgeons at the end of it. So this is something that I feel all surgeons and all surgical teams need to do and need to be involved in. 
just say 34% of adults of working age um, have dependent children. So this isn't some freak, this is just how everyone has to work. Um, and my personal um, plea really is to understand that surgical uh, training is a craft specialty and we do need time to train and to practice. And actually 50% of some of our doctors in training time is spent on administration or, or uh, service commitments. And I think we should do better, particularly in the craft specialties at this critical time, because we do, we do need fantastic surgeons at the end of it, which all, all of um, the team on this evening are. So um, with that, um, I just remind you, there's lots of information on our website, and we've got a fantastic diverse panel tonight to show you that all families come in all different sizes and shapes. Um, and I'd like to hand over to Nicola to talk about how she's parenting. So thank you, can I have the next slide? Thanks. Oh, Nicola, I can't hear you. Are you muted? There you go. I was on mute. <laughs> Hi, so I'm, I'm Nicola. I'm an ST7 in ENT and I'm based in South Yorkshire. Um, I'm also one of the Women in Surgery Forum committee members, which is why I've been asked to, to speak today. Um, and the picture on the slide there is of me and my family. So that's my husband, Mike, and my little boy, Eddie, um, who was one in May. Um, and if you look a bit closer at Eddie, he's not in a 1980s sort of music video. He's got a headband on, but he's actually a bone conduction hearing aid. He was born profoundly deaf in his left ear um, and he's got some moderate hearing loss in his other ear, um, which has added a whole kind of new dimension to parenting when your child has a problem in your own sort of area of expertise. Um, so I was due to return from maternity leave on 1st of April. I had a lovely plan in place. Um, I was going less than full time, 80%. I was um, having a couple of days of supernumerary um, training and then I was going to have a bit of an enhanced supervision period because as a senior ENT trainee, you are often on your own in hospital expected to deal with airway emergencies. And after having kind of over a year out, I had some pregnancy problems. Um, so I finished a bit earlier than I expected to. Um, it was felt that I probably needed a bit of support when I first came back and there is the support um, returning to training network that was really helpful um, but obviously I returned mid-pandemic and all of that went completely out the window. Um, I did have my couple of days supernumerary um, and then all of our juniors were redeployed so all of our house officers, all of our core trainees, our GP trainees were all gone and I was stepped down onto the resident on call rotor so I have only done non-resident on calls since 2012. Um, it was a bit of a shock to the system than having to do night um, and resident events um, and to add sort of extra you know nightmare on top of that um, our nursery shut so even for key workers they decided to close um, so I was left in a situation where I've had a year out of training I'm already feeling quite apprehensive about going back um, and then we've got the logistics of trying to deal with childcare both of us working um, and my husband is a key worker, he's not medical, um, but he was expected to work full time as well. So for me, the main challenge for parenting has been the logistics of COVID and um, managing that. Unfortunately, I've managed to swap shifts. I did quite a lot of weekends and night shifts so that I could do childcare in the day. My husband was able to work from home part of the time and we've kind of muddled through. Unfortunately, the nursery reopened two weeks ago, so we are <laughs> we're doing a lot better now. Um, for me, another thing that I found quite difficult about coming back to work and um, especially during the COVID period is my confidence. So, you know, before I left, I was senior trainee, just about to set FRCS, um, coming to the end of my training. And then I've had a period of time out and then I've come back during a time when you know, I wasn't sure what to expect. I've got no idea what COVID was going to cause. Um, and I think anybody having had a period of time out, even if it's just a holiday, you're a bit rusty when you come back after a few weeks, but after a whole year and then into a completely different job role, um, I definitely had some imposter syndrome going on, but I'm slowly kind of coming out of that. Um, and then the third thing that I found really challenging is the parental guilt, which will, you know, if you're a parent, everybody has it. Um, for me, I'd never left Eddie before um, at night time, never had a night without me. And then all of a sudden I'm doing three night shifts in a row. Um, and that just made me feel such like such a bad mother. But actually he was fine. He slept through for the first time. <laughs> um, um, but then you've also got the surgical guilt. So you feel like you're not giving your all at work because you're part, part time. And, 
and actually that's not true you you know you're managing everything um and i think you've just got to kind of realize that that, that guilt is there but you, you shouldn't feel bad you know you're doing a really good job whatever uh, in whatever situation you are um, but there have been some positives for me um, coming back so i have really appreciated my colleagues my colleagues have been amazing my bosses have been very supportive um, my registrar colleagues have done swaps with me so that I can be at home again for childcare if needs be. One of them stayed late after the night shift so I could take Eddie back for his first day at nursery. Um, obviously, we all know commuting and nursery times don't always work very well together. Um, and actually, ironically, I've had more time with Eddie than I would have done. So it's almost been a bit like an extended period of maternity leave because I'm doing resident 13-hour shifts. I only do three a week at the moment. Um, whereas I would be working Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays plus non-resident on calls. So it's been actually quite quite nice. I feel like a bit of a fraud. Um, and one final thing that I found really, really good um, was breastfeeding. So I was breastfeeding when I came back from maternity leave. And there are laws in place to say that you have to have certain things uh, provided for you. But obviously, given the pandemic, I just thought that that was going to go out the window and it didn't. They were fantastic. I work at Doncaster Hospital at the moment. I was given a room. I was given a fridge in the room that was my own personal fridge. I was had a sign for the door so nobody could come in, lock on the door. Um, they did a really good job. I still, you know, was the only doctor in the hospital for ENT. So I was being bleeped mid-feed and leaking all over my scrubs and all sorts of things, but it couldn't have been done any better. So, um, you know, when anybody is listening and is going back and worrying about that, you know, they have to provide you with places to be, to breastfeed and express. Um, and you know it can be done even mid pandemic. And that's all I've got to say for now. Oh, Scarlett, you're still on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Um, can we have the next slide, please? I think. Yep, we've got Victoria next. Please go ahead, Vic. Oh, hi there. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm a, a Royal College of Surgeons of England Council member. Uh, also on the WINS um, uh, committee as well, um, and um, I'm a, a colorectal trainee in the KSS deanery. Um, the reason I think uh, we, I was going to wanted to speak today was I'm a less than full time trainee, mum of two, and obviously, um, as I've put here, pregnant during Corona, uh, which um, wasn't obviously planned because I'm seven months pregnant, um, but it has had quite a few knock on effects for both myself and um, and my family. So. One of the uh, issues I've found is um, I was happy to carry on working and I wanted to work, but but quite rightly, I suppose the hospital said, no, um, you know, you're, you're, you're pregnant. And my husband is immunocompromised. We're both frontline NHS workers. And so we both had to go into the high shielding category, uh, which I found incredibly frustrating because we've got a one and a three year old at home. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm pregnant as well. So you're not necessarily feeling on your A game. Um, and we're working from home. So trying to do clinics and both of us doing clinics and triage from home, um, both jobs equally important. Um, and in an ideal world, maybe if you had someone that wasn't a, another medic, you could tag team things and uh, maybe one could get up early and one could work late in the evening. But obviously we both needed to be available between sort of nine and nine and six. And if both jobs are, are both as important, it's, it's been really tricky trying to do this. Um, like I've had kids running in and out of the room when they're not meant to be and one of us is meant to be watching them and you're trying to take a history about PR bleeding and whether someone's stools are formed um, and have they got cancer. I mean, it's, it's, it's really awful. I felt really unprofessional at times and really stressed. As Corona has gone on and we've got ourselves into a bit more of a, 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 a routine and actually the children have got a bit more used to because uh, at first obviously both kids are like wow we never see our parents and now we see them every day um I shouldn't say that but obviously th that is a little bit like what our lives are like because obviously they're in childcare from really early until really late often I miss bedtime and I'm on night shifts and stuff and they've been um, they've been delighted to have us both home but then they weren't happy at the start about mum or mum or dad going off and disappearing into another room because I think they must have thought oh god they're going they're going to leave us again but now we're back into the swing of things. It's a bit more manageable and things are a little bit more OK. And and actually CBBS has been a godsend for when I'm trying to take tricky histories. I feel really bad saying that, too. Um, but um, so, so that's been really tricky. And then the second thing I've really struggled with has been um, the guilt, but not just like the guilt about work, 
my, with my children. It's more the guilt about my colleagues, my mates are still on the front line, basically risking their lives every day. Maybe not so much anymore, but when it went during the peak of the coronavirus, I, I'm sat at home, you know, calling people about colon cancer and they are... Uh, you know, they're they're taking, you know, they're operating on people and you know, I should be there too. Uh, and so I have had this awful, terrible, terrible guilt. And I'm like, we're the only NHS workers on the street. And every Thursday, everyone comes out and they clap and ha half of them are clapping at us, you know, because we're NHS workers. And I have felt absolutely terrible and have sort of been like, you know, don't clap. For, you know, it's definitely not us that are saving the world right now. And, and it's been this, yeah, I have really struggled with, with the guilt side of things. And um, had I been allowed to go to work, I would have just gone to work, but it was out of my control. And so I haven't been, uh, but that's been, that's been a really big major, I've got over it now and now, I've, now, not, now it's not so exciting anymore, uh, you know, until the second wave comes, but that's been a problem for me. Um, however, loads of good things. And probably the main thing is that I'm now totally set up to work from home. Um, and I think that going forward, you know, what was before not possible with, you know, hospitals saying, oh, you know, you can't do clinics from home. And you know, actually, it's been really amazing. And the setup works really, really well. Um, and I do think it will make a really big difference to to, to uh, if it carries on, which I think it will be hard to come back fully from. I don't think it will stop completely. Uh, and going forward, I think it will make things much, much better. Um, so uh, I, ho I hope this change still carries on. And um, the other thing that slightly worries me is that I, I won't have operated since April of this year. And if I take six or 12 months of maternity, whatever it ends up being, uh, even if I only take six months, I actually won't have operated for a full year. And if I take more than six months, I won't have operated for a year and whatever it is. And, and like Scarlett was saying, you know, when you're in a, a, um, a specialty, surgical specialty it, you know that that's quite a long time to have not operated um i think the longest i've not operated before was about eight months and so um I, that really worries me but i'm not at that point yet but nicola has just been and it, I, you do get over it and they'll sure there'll be support but um that is something that constantly plays on my mind every minute that i'm not even i haven't even had the baby third baby yet and i and i'm already de-skilled so um anyway it's not all bad and lots of good things have come out of corona so i'll hand over to someone else brilliant well done and can i just say it's like riding a bicycle actually you pick it back up and there's there's a really good report from the academy of medical royal colleges about getting back into if you've had some a breakout of training or work getting back in and how you can ramp back up again and, and should have support so you'll be fine you'll be great it's lovely really lovely to hear um, your story can i have the next slide please and I think, yeah, we've got Liam next. Go for it, Liam. Thank you. And quite clearly, that's not me, but that, uh, that is um, my daughter on a, on a beach that was not Bournemouth. But um, I'm not going to tell you where it was because <laughs> I'd like it to remain that quiet. Um, my name's Liam. Um, I'm, an ex I'm an ST6 in general surgery and also in the Kent Surrey and Sussex uh, rotation. Um, I suppose I'm coming at this from a slightly different, well, from, there's the, the standout feature here compared to my other two colleagues, as I am, I'm a man. Um, so I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle. But um, his, it's, it's been an interesting time during COVID. And historically, um, and in general, I think we are always at risk of being prejudged. I am a large, white, rugby playing man. And that therefore has tended to court sort of the slightly conspiratorial sort of sniggers or you know comments from some of my older male colleagues about things such as parenthood and roles of individuals and roles of you know people in those situations with regards to surgical training um and um well i've always sort of come back as having well i've got a bit of a shock for you because i'm 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 really very keen on trying to break this taboo, if you like, of parenthood and surgical training. And, um, you know, the thing that really cemented at home was when we, um, uh, our little daughter Emily arrived 18 months ago and has totally and utterly changed uh, my priorities on, on its head. And yet still being able to balance things. My wife is a full time GP. She works four and a half, five days a week. Um, which are the equivalent of doing an on-call every day um, and 
you know in normal times we can balance that with our various childcare arrangements and as we've heard already from Nicola and Vic things you know do turn on have turned on their heads completely um, with COVID. We've been very fortunate in that our childminders um, were willing to continue to take our child but did insist on having all of their pre-booked holidays so we then had to um, look at things actually pretty dispassionately and think about um, you know first of all the priority of looking after our daughter uh, and second of all equally you know and, and still important the effect it would have on our colleagues and Vic's already talked about the guilt and the guilt is real and ultimately what it came down to is my wife is a GP she works in a small institution with five uh, of a total of five GPs two of whom by this point were isolating and for her to go off and be a full-time parent would have reduced their workforce down to 40 percent um, and with me working in a in a far larger institution which we or if the opinion could weather the storm um, the decision we took was that I was going to be the full-time parent and this wasn't some sort of epiphany moment but I what it did what it did demonstrate to me and what I've been so fortunate about and again to reiterate uh, some of Nicola's experiences I've been really overwhelmed with the way in which the institution but also our profession has adapted really very quickly to, to leap to support uh, me in my personal circumstance but also knowing the experience of other colleagues of mine in my institution um, you know we I think it's it's sensible to talk about the challenges we've you know and certainly the first of those challenges as I've said was balancing that commitment to our daughter and um, the service to our patients my wife um, the guilt was ramped up to a thousand because she was at work it's the inverse of what Vic was describing she was having to prioritize her patients and a service and building a tent in their practice car park whilst I was you know entertaining our daughter and playing in the park and generally having a lovely time um you know and, and we are we you know we do feel that both to our families and both to provide a service to our patients who need us then that's coupled with with fear and i don't think we've really touched on fear yet and certainly in the early days before we knew what on earth um the pattern of this virus was and was it going to affect our loved ones were we carrying this around with us on our hair our clothes our shoes um, you know, we were deployed to intensive care as well as surgical on calls fairly early on. Um, we've no real idea as to whether we were bringing this into our home and was it all just a ticking time bomb until my wife or Emily or I got, got unwell. And with that in mind, even before lockdown, we had spoken to our families and said, you know, look, we don't know how this is behaving. We're going to have to keep away from you. We haven't until last week we hadn't seen any of our nearest and dearest since the 7th of March and actually that was very very isolating but what's really carried us through um, have been our colleagues um, and with that in mind and sort of without wanting to cover too much ground on my own um, again as Nicholas sort of paid tribute to her employers I'd like to pay some tribute to Mason and Tunbridge Wells because they've been overwhelmingly supportive they've been so flexible and I really hope that one of the positive outcomes from COVID is that this can act as a catalyst for change that we can see that we can break this taboo of parenthood it's not something that should be exclusively borne by women and it, the change has to also come from us chaps as well we have if we stand up and say and speak up for our rights as as fathers and being able to balance fatherhood and surgical training in equal measure then it will relieve some of that burden from our female colleagues and I would hope that change could come from within. I'm, an, I'm a shameful optimist but um, those are my thoughts um, and so I'll be interested to hear what um, Aaron's experiences have been. Brilliant, thanks Liam. Um, can we have the next slide and Aaron it's straight to you. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me to this. It's a real privilege to um, to talk to you all. I'm one of the consultants in general surgery in Calderham Huddersfield, and the Yorkshire Regional um, Director. And I think everything everyone so far has said, we've, we've all felt really. Um, my wife's a radiographer, and I think perhaps the thing that we um, noticed first is 
as you plan your life as surgeons, um, no matter what stage of work you're in, um, or what stage of training or a career you're in, you actually have things really well organised, and your Mondays are set, you know, who's doing the pickups at what time, Tuesdays, grandparents might come to help, Wednesdays, and it's almost like a military operation. And so quickly, or so many of those options were just completely taken away. Um, and I was, you know, listening to Nicola about nursery being closed pretty much all of a sudden. Um, for us, we were, we we're very lucky that my wife's parents are amazing with our children, um, who, are, who are nine and seven. So all of the normal bits of childcare, that all of the normal bits that we have to help us were removed. Um, we have a fairly young consultant department in, in, our, in our hospital. Um, and so everyone's in, this, in a similar position. Everyone, um, a lot of the parents are key workers. A lot of the parents have um, young children. Um, and one of the things that I was most proud of and most privileged was that how supportive the department was with each other. We all recognized that each of us were going through all of the things that have been spoken about already, the fear about what's ahead, the fear about um, bringing things to our children and so on. Um, one of the things I've been particularly mindful of as well is, um, although it's difficult for us to plan, we've actually been very lucky in the sense that no matter what shifts or work that we do, we've maintained a salary, we've maintained um, a job and maintained um, an income. And, and many of our friends and many of our colleagues within healthcare and certainly outside healthcare have not had the same, um, same luck. And then finally, a lot of the things that we, all of us have, to stay well um, involve hobbies and interests and um, you know I play a lot of football and my you know you have a social life um, and all of those things have been removed from all of us as um, husband and wife and friends and so some of the things that we've found difficult have been trying to combine the, the children's activities which all of a sudden they're missing out on in addition to school as well as ours as well um, I'd be really interested to hear people's experience. I'm really looking forward to answering questions, um, but I echo everything that's been said already. And to my mind, the key thing has been uh, the support of my consultant colleagues uh, in my hospital, uh, and I feel extremely lucky to work for them, and I'm really looking forward to this webinar. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's, it's, as I say, so lovely to have all these different views. Um, so can we have the next slide, please? And um, Ginny, over to you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm, um, I'm my name is Ginny Bobrick. I'm a vascular surgeon in Kent. We seem to have KSS seem to be here in um, great uh, numbers tonight. It wasn't done on purpose. Um, I've got four children. Uh, this slide shows my eldest three from my first marriage. My eldest son was affected by COVID by being in year 11, being told on a Wednesday you're leaving school in two days time and you're not going to be having all the nice prom parties and leaving things and you're not going to do your exams. And we've had a 16 year old at home with pretty with really no direction for the last few months, which has been quite challenging with a teenager. My uh, twins, they're 13, they're identical twins. Um, and they are autistic, they have severe learning disabilities, they have global developmental delay, severe speech and language um, issues, problems, um, and they left home when they were nine um, uh, because I was un un unable to, at that stage, um, care for them as well as, um, as I would have wanted to. Um, so I went through two tribunals with the local authority to get them into a 52 week residential school. Um, that was quite a, a, a traumatic process of the children leaving home um, and initially being with foster carers before they were placed in the schools which they're now thriving in and doing exceedingly well in. The, the school, they have some children who are 38 weeks and those uh, residential um, children and they were sent home to their parents so they also have severe uh, special needs but their parents have been coping with them single-handedly uh, since the end of March. Um, my children have remained at the school because they have 52 week residential. The school went into lockdown and I wasn't able to see them for eight weeks and I usually see my children every two weeks I go and visit them or in between after work I drive down the M to go and see them as well. 
and that was quite hard and trying to communicate with one of the children on Skype which I Skype them twice a week and they're ignoring you because they're upset because you haven't come to see them and they don't understand why you haven't come to, to see them and so they ignore you on Skype it made that quite a challenging interaction but I sent them lots of pictures uh, I sent them a picture of me in full PPE to try and get them to understand what I was doing um, and the school were very good working with them with key sessions talking about the virus and teaching them things so when I did get to see them um, it was uh, a really lovely experience and I've, I've had several visits since I think they've forgiven me now I was I did discover then I could send them lots of toys through Amazon so that also helped quite a bit can I have the next slide please You got the next slide, sorry. So I started COVID pandemic as a mother of three and I've ended it up as a mother of four. And this is my wife and she's an ST7 in TNO, uh, also in KSS, um, doing a PhD at Imperial College at the moment. Um, and she uh, was heavily pregnant at the start of the pandemic. So they did recall her and she pointed out to them that she wasn't going to be able to help because she was uh, 34, 35 weeks pregnant at the time. So we had two colleagues shielding in my department. We're a small department, five consultants with two shielding really takes the on-call rotor down to small numbers. So on a Saturday morning when she was about 36 weeks pregnant, I said, I'm going off now for four days and four nights on call and I'll see you on Wednesday evening. Just um, it'll be fine. You know, nothing's going to happen. It'll be fine. And later that day, she sent me a text saying, are you really not going to come home? I'm, I'm not feeling very well. And, and I've had a few cramps. And can you just come home? You know, just come home and then you can go back. So I went home, walked through the front door about nine o'clock at night. And she was obviously in labour, bouncing on her um, big, big blue ball. No, it's pink, big pink ball that she'd got to bounce on. So there I was on call without any colleagues really to call upon. Um, my wife in premature labour um, heading up to the hospital where the baby was born four weeks early. Um, a little girl. So now I have a girl and can buy pink things to add to the th three boys that we have. Um, and she was born in the early hours of a Monday morning, Sunday, sorry, late, um, late Sunday night. And I left on the Monday morning. And because she was premature, there was a delayed period of time in hospital uh, and I couldn't visit. So I was allowed to be with them while they were in labour and while the baby was delivered. As soon as she left the labour ward, I had to go. Uh, and so that meant that I was at home um, with nothing to do, so I went back to work. And we were short staff, they were happy to have me. Um, and I just did a continue long call. So they came out of um, hospital later that week because I really wanted to take my paternity leave. All the forms called it paternity leave. So I went on paternity leave. And my colleagues, my two remaining colleagues, held the fort for two weeks. And then when I got back, I did a one in two to try and pay them back for it. So I've probably spent more time at work than I have at home, which has left um, Amy sort of holding the fort with a 16 year old who's grumpy because he's not at school and with a newborn baby, which was incredibly difficult. And, you know, when you've got a newborn baby, you want to show that baby to everyone. You want everyone to see how beautiful they are. You want your parents to see them. You want your family to see them, your friends to see them and everyone to make you feel like you've done the most amazing thing. And we couldn't do that. So that was really hard about being a new parent in um, COVID time. Um, and the other problem is that I go on, to, I've been on to ITU with the proning of patients, I've been looking after COVID positive patients, and then I go home to a newborn baby. And that's been very, that's made me feel very guilty as well. Um, and I'm sure like everyone else, you sort of, as soon as you get home, you're running up to the bath or the shower just to try and decontaminate yourself before you go and see your family. Uh, so so uh, that's my COVID story. Brilliant. Thanks, Ginny. That's that's really amazing and it's 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 lovely to hear and um and have that story um we could probably get rid of the slides now um so that we can just answer any questions and anyone on the webinar who wants to send in questions please please do and we're all ready to answer um just, do any of you want to kick off any of the panelists want to kick off with something anything that you forgot to mention think is interesting that you want to go talk about? Aaron, is that? I think um, one of the one of the key things that um, about parenthood through through all of this is um, how I personally have how, how find it difficult to kind of retain some focus on occasions because so many things that you're doing on a day to day basis were quite intent for a period of time. So you're really concentrating at being at work, you're really thinking about 
um, the rotors, you, and there's so many people who, who we're responsible for, our patients, of course, and our trainees to try and try and make things um, work as much as possible. And I certainly found that getting home at the end of the day as even more tired than you would normally or otherwise be. And so, you know, oftentimes you come home from a day of work and you're already a little bit worried about, you know, making sure you give as much of yourself as you can and you need to to, to family. And I just found that the reserve that we had at the end of some of the days that over the last few months were really tricky and really difficult. Um, and I think some of some of the panel have already talked about some long term changes, which um, we hope to come from this. My hope would be that um, we do a lot of talking about health and well-being. We do a lot of talking about what's important to keep ourselves sane and happy and and kind of and well. But actually, this has been one of those times that's been really important to almost make sure about that and ask each other how we're feeling, make sure that we build in time and build in genuine periods of time off. And it's kind of helped me really understand trainee rotors as well. All too often, the rotors that hospitals make or that um, departments make might work in terms of being legal, but it's not necessarily great in terms of being a good quality of life. You know, the odd day off here and there isn't necessarily meaningful time off. And I think having this period of time where it's really made all of us really conscious about the need for proper time to be able to wind down and to be able to think about things, I hope will allow departments in the future to make sustainable rotors for, for, for all of us and for all of our trainees as well. I think there's probably also been an issue of taking things home, the stress of what we've been through at work. You know, at times there's been difficult decisions to make, treating patients in different ways, in a way we probably wouldn't have before COVID. Um, and seeing things that, again, you know, for me, once in a career time experience, this pandemic, and it's taking that stress home and dealing with it um, has been quite difficult as well. Um, we haven't got any questions come through, so please feel free to ask anything you want. We're here ready to share. Um, I've got a question for Jenny. Um, Liam, sorry, do you have a question? He wants to ask me. I, I'd, be really interested, I'd be really interested from the trainees' point of view um, about, you, you know, certainly the, the trainees on the panel here are really well connected, um, you know, brilliant, brilliant representatives for the future of surgery. Um, and I'd be really interested to know um, their experiences of um, departments that have done it well. It sounds like Doncaster and Tubridge Wells and Kent have been brilliant actually. But um be interested to know whether you've had any feedback about things that haven't gone quite as well as you'd wanted them to, um, or what's worked for trainees and what hasn't worked. Nicola and Liam, do you want to have you got some I'll I'll go first. Um I think um, I think one of the overwhelming things, again, most of the feedback I've had have been from colleagues who have been pregnant. And I think have had similar experiences to to you, Vic. I think there's been um, they've been trying to balance that overwhelming feeling of guilt. But uh, you know, I think I think a lot of it has just been a bit of shock amongst trainees that all of a sudden there's been this huge ability and appetite to to drive forward some changes that perhaps you know people have been you know angling for for some time there's a lot of work being done around burnout there's a lot of work being done about you know balancing you know the various um, facets to developing your surgical career be those you know educational other pursuits family and so on and so forth and all of a sudden you know with let's be honest this covid has essentially reduced our specialties respective specialist workloads significantly certainly in an elective sense it's just interesting to think about how that's going to how that will move forward um i actually uh, it's in i just wanted to pick up on a point that Ginny made earlier which was about how you got your leave and the interesting fact that you know by virtue of the fact that you're 
that maybe the system can't hasn't quite adapted to thinking terribly laterally that what you were applying for rather than let's call it a better term parenting leave or you know parenthood or new parent leave or something like that let's but let's call it paternity leave um you know as and again maybe this will ring true of our when i when i applied for my paternity leave i was told because it is two weeks i was told to predict the date of arrival of my daughter and uh that would be my paternity leave plus two weeks um which is a bit stressful um and fortunately emily was relatively punctual but jenny what are your thoughts about how as a prof i mean as a profession maybe with your dmd hat on how how can we how can we improve that and how can we equilibrate it or take away some of that some of that you know taboo perhaps of the second parents for want of a better term taking time off well i mean as i i think i sort of when we were talking before um the other day when i said that i've asked for shared parental leave at my hospital and i'm the first person to ask for that male or female there's still that feeling within medicine as a whole that we should be we shouldn't take that time off um to do the to 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 look after the children um, I suppose I'm in a slightly different position asking, you know, I went in asking, can I have some maternity leave? Oh, you're not pregnant. Oh, no, it's because my wife's pregnant. Then you want paternity leave. No, I'm not a man. So it was quite a difficult conversation. And the only way I could get anyone to understand what leave I was asking for was to say, just call it paternity leave. Um, but it's a form and and these things will change. Um, I think what we're looking for is more flexibility to people's um, careers. I mean, saying to you that you can have to predict the date that your child's going to be born is is nigh on impossible. And I and surgeons need to present a a picture of being much more flexible. And the NHS actually is the NHS. It's not surgeons. It's the NHS needs to be more flexible to the doctors that work within it. Yeah, I totally agree. I think like this. This is a so in my first pregnancy, um, my husband. Um, yeah, we had to. He had to give a date for his two weeks pre-planned paternity leave, um, and uh, well, very luckily it fell within that. But he ha he couldn't get his on-call shift covered, and when the baby was only five days old, he went and did his you know weekend on-call. I think just purely because the department or the or whoever it was didn't realise that actually no paternity leave means you're you have you know it should be covered and he didn't want to rock the boat as lots of surgeons don't because they want a job there when they or you know because if you're a trainee you're you are in a slightly more vulnerable position in some ways because you don't want to kick up a fuss and i think and so so that i think that that raised so many issues for me because obviously i my and our, yeah he wasn't very well uh and i you know then i didn't have my husband around and then um and then i think the other thing is is that, that well, I don't know, it raises lots of issues, but but if you've got a small department, like maybe you were saying, well, you've only got a few colleagues that are left because they're shielding, for example, during corona, or if just in life, not corona, you've only got another few colleagues that can cover the on-calls, they're, they're directly affected by you. Like, so the fact that I do, I have a day off a week, and I know that that, that someone else is having to cover my on-call shift that week, and I think, it, and I feel terrible about it, not just during corona, during normal times mm -hmm. as well. And I think that I think that the the there isn't that much slack in the system. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't really have had to go back and do a one in two after two weeks paternity leave. <laughs> I know you probably did it because you were, you know, but, but and you've probably done it because actually you know you feel bad. But, but actually, the what system is it? Isn't, it isn't set up for for people to go less than full time. It isn't set up really for because I don't know any. I hardly know any trusts that are like, oh yeah, we've got a less than full-time trainee and we have a permanent locum employed so that no one else is being sort of put upon to mm -hmm. cover that one shift a week or whatever it is. You know, it's, it's, it's your, your colleagues and your friends ultimately that are therefore taking the slack. And then, and then it feels, you know, you're, you feel bad even if they're not making you feel bad. And actually that normally falls to the, to the female, um, which is why I really hope that Corona changes these things when, so there's more co-parenting and that less than full-time trainees aren't all females. There's only six in the country, surgical male, less than full-time trainees. Uh, so you know, until that changes, nothing's going to change. Um, and until the NHS is able to pick up the slack or have more things in place for, for um, people that aren't, aren't, can't come in for paternity or for less than full-time reasons, uh, yeah, no, nothing will ever equalize. I think that's, really interesting the 
other specialties have got it better and i think um the specialties that maybe find it hard to fill their posts and much more um, respectful of the people that are there for every moment that they're there. Uh, that's 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 my view. Um, we've got a question in. Nicola, can um, can you switch your mic on so I can give a question to you? Um, Nicola, uh, can I, uh, there's a question from one of the people watching of what's the single most effective supportive or protective factor for you during the pandemic do you want to take that or should we give it to someone else and i think you're still muted oh by me ah That's thank you it wasn't it wasn't muted by me <laughs> it was okay. muted by the college um can you just say that again i didn't hear because i was oh sorry um, what's the single most effective supportive or protective factor for you during this pandemic um I think, I mean, I've already said about it, but I think the breastfeeding thing was a really big thing for me. I was really stressed about it. So my little boy is, um, he was a bottle refuser. Um, he would only drink milk from a cup and he would only drink my milk from a cup. He wouldn't take cow's milk or oat milk or whatever you want to give them. Um, it was just a little bit awkward. <laughs> and so going back to work when he was still exclusively breastfed was really, really stressful. Um, and I've been panicking about it. And there was a really good, um, Thing on facebook actually it's like breastfeeding for doctors support group and there's people are in this situation all the time um but the, the the trust being so supportive about that really really you know made a big difference for me um as soon as i got there i showed me code um you know all the bosses were very very supportive about it including when i leaked all over my scrubs in front of one of the mid <laughs> um, just you know put an apron on and carried on but um everyone was really supportive and i think that for me has been it has been you know, great but there's been lots of things but that's i was gonna say something about one of the things that victoria was saying about because i don't think it's just the the system i think it's partly down to us as surgeons not wanting to um, like you said, rock the boat and um, almost be seen as um, which is how I felt anyway. So when I was pregnant, I had quite a lot of pregnancy problems. I had really awful um, SPD and I ended up on crutches and I should not have been at work. Um, and I just felt too guilty um, to my colleagues and to my bosses and to myself really and didn't want to let myself down. I carried on and I shouldn't have been there. Um, you know, I was crying on the way to work because I was in so much pain and then operating all day and it was very very bad and in retrospect there's no way that I would do that now um, and I think sometimes we need to actually say no I'm, I'm not safe I shouldn't be doing this um, or you know I should be having that time off we need to be a bit more assertive about it so if I have another baby I think I'll definitely be more assertive and put myself first rather than putting the job first you know nobody remembers that I had an extra few weeks off because they sent me home when I went in on crutches um, you know, I've been off for a year, I've come back, nobody's even mentioned it, it's only me that you know, was worried about that, so so if anybody is watching and is in that situation, make sure you're looking after yourself, nobody else will. And I maybe add a little addendum to that, um, Nicola, which is also, I 100% I agree with you, and the other thing that we can all do, um, which I think some of us, we do it subconsciously or, or otherwise, and it's a product of how busy the NHS is and how busy the system is. Um, you know, the the sort of the deep sigh when you hear that someone's off sick or the or the you know the internal eye rolling and, and all of those things are are not in themselves malign things, but those are the things that that contribute to that. And we know, I know, and I'm gonna put my hand up, I know that when I've said, Oh, such and such is sick today, you've got to do three ward rounds, and I might go, and do you know what that person's sick and they and, and they should be at home and they should be looking after themselves or their child is sick or what, whatever the reason is and i think for me the guilt is driven sometimes by the fact of my own reaction to knowing that you, you, you sort of see what i mean um so i think that's something we can all do um and hopefully in part that will help us to feel less guilty Although I totally appreciate, and as I've said, a lot of the guilt is very internal. 
I don't think you ever stop with the guilt as being I don't I can't talk about being working from fa father working mother because of the school plays you've missed the assemblies you've missed and and the functions and, and you just feel very guilty about all of those and children also know exactly which buttons to press to make you feel the most guilty that they can um, but then they get you know if you're working and they, and they benefit from that as well with with the role model that you present to them and the benefits that they get from you working so it, it is a, a sort of such a, 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 a it's a real difficult um type sort of i can't think of the word but it, it's the balance trying to find the balance to to make sure that your your, your children thrive it's very hard thank you We've got another question in Ginny. i think because you're Deputy Director of Medical Education, this might be one for you. Um, what can I do if I'm not getting the return to work support that I need? Well, that's very sad if you're not. I think it depends what region you're in. So you can go through HEE, look on their website, there'll be an SRTT um, uh, page there. Um, every school has a, a champion, so the School of uh, Surgery um, or School of Medicine in every, um, uh, every region. And every hospital has an SRTT champion. I'm that champion here at Medway Trust. Um, so there are lots of people to contact to make sure you get what what you should be having. Um, and I, you know, that it, I think the problem that they found is that people don't know enough about it to get all that they are due to get. So the information's there. Um, but the work, first place to go to would be the website for HEE for their region. Thank you. Um, there are little seminars and things that you can go to as well beforehand. I went to a couple whilst I was on maternity leave that were really useful. Just one about the kind of planning aspect and the forms you need to fill in and who to go to and that sort of stuff. And then I went to another one which was on sort of mindfulness and confidence and that sort of thing. And they were they were great um, and it really easy accessible if you know where to look. But it's finding where to look. Amount of money. Different regions decide how to use that money. Some regions um, will say which courses you have to go on. Um, others will give you a choice of what courses you can go on. And so every region is different as into what they'll, they'll offer. And of course, different specialties, um, is it like the anaesthetists have back to gas, back to gas. And they have, they're very ahead of the curve of this for surgery, but the different specialties have uh, their own programs as well. So it's just looking within each region, what's on offer and then within each specialty and you will find champions for your region for your specialty and in your hospital thank you um then yeah Aaron, go for it i was just going to say one of the things and from the other from the other side of of um in terms of planning roaches and planning things i, I always think for for our trainees who come um, either back to work or less than full time um because of the guilt that all of you have really kind of eloquently expressed and all of us feel we always want to think about fitting into the system but actually i always think that the better way is for us to for me when i'm planning things in my hospital for example i always ask people what do you need what works best for you and what we can do is build a training schedule around that um and if there's um if there's that kind of approach to it then rather than feeling guilty about what you can and can't do it's incumbent upon all of us to try and make that training schedule try and make those days at work as valuable and as productive as possible but fit around what what all of us need rather than what the system needs necessarily because it's actually more flexible than you think um we just kind of for some reason historically or otherwise make it inflexible but actually if we get involved in these things ourselves as, as all of you have said um if we don't don't leave it to road coordinators or people in in far and distant departments. If we get involved in these things ourselves, it means that the people who we work with um, ultimately recognise what each of us need. And I think that's really important. So whenever, if you are coming back or anyone who's, who um, is thinking about less than full time or anything like that, have a really clear idea of what you need and then ask your supervisors and HG and so on to fit around you as best as possible and all being well we should be able to accommodate that yeah I think I agree with that and that's great if you've got someone supportive doing that but I think I think one of the things we need to try and do in surgery and I think we're massively behind the curve probably at the bottom really is changing the culture of surgery and and 
and and saying so Liam and I are looking into stuff on burnout for example and the thing that comes up time and time again is that, that we don't have control over our lives our rotors uh, and ro rotor and t time at work and being out of control of all of these things is is a really huge factor and actually you know in surgery it's not okay for us to go um, actually, you know, I've got a school play. I need, you know, you know, we feel embarrassed to kind of say this kind of thing. And I think I'm not going to generalise too much, but boys probably feel even more embarrassed. It's like a bit OK for girls now because we've had these brilliant female pioneers and we're all allowed to go less than full time, even if you do feel guilty. But but, but, but it's still a huge taboo thing. Boys are not less than full time trainees until they, like, they lead by example. I don't know. Aaron, if you're less than full time or not as a consultant, but until people lead by example and show that it's okay to be less than full time, to pick up your kids, to to say that actually I need a, t a day at home because my kid's sick, not just leave it to the other half at home, um, nothing will change. And I think until, and, and if rotors are, like I agree, if rotors are run by rotor coordinators who are just looking at service provision, um, mm -hmm it's really really difficult to try and take control and change that and I think that is something we definitely need to do and and, and actually there's the A&E have done it really well and what one of the departments at one of the hospitals I've worked in the A&E department actually just let the A&E trainees choose their rota pick a pick when when they want to work and how they want to work all gets put into a system and the shifts that aren't then covered that are left are then divvied up and so you might get some and apparently the the retention rate in this a e department is one of the best in the whole country there's no reason that surgery can't do that can't, i mean if you know what shifts need to be covered you know what on calls need to be covered you know what elective lists need to be covered there's a way of doing things that work for everyone not just yeah the the, the, the department with my service. with my lesson with my less than full-time hours um, when I spoke to HR about it, I have to do so many Fridays out of the seven week road to, to, to make up my hours. And the, the HR person suggested that on week one, I did a Monday and week two, I did a Tuesday. And week three, I did a Wednesday. It's like, how, how does that help with childcare? That does, I need to have set days. I can't just be picking and choosing. Yeah. And when I spoke to the bosses, they were like, that's absolutely crazy. But their little system, I think it's called Allocate or something. It doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, so it worked for the computer, but it doesn't work for you. So yeah, thanks. Back for you, back for you, Dave. <laughs> well, um, we've had um, another. This is going to a different topic about resuming surgical services after the pandemic. So we've had quite a long comment in saying, guys, as a consultant anaesthetist and intensivist with a partner who's senior staff on the same ICU, we really struggled just juggling childcare for two daughters. The other parents have managed to look after our third child but it meant we didn't see him for nearly three months. He's shielding and now we're coming out of this and we've seen him three times. Lo and behold, he's unwell and COVID negative, but the stress and guilt have been terrible. We as intensivists are on our knees and feel terrible. We'd love to support you more, but personally, I want nothing to do with any electives just yet. We're broken, sorry. Will you forgive us and cut us some slack? So that's quite heartfelt and, you know, huge families across the NHS have, um, stepped up and changed their lives but um how do we resume elective surgery and balance it to, you know my hope is that people will be valued for the time they're there and what they can offer and that we won't get people doing stuff that you don't need a medical degree to do you know so people are using their skills and we get training back on track because we desperately need well-trained surgeons out at the end of this anyone want to launch in on that but can I just I think it's a balance. I don't think we've been given any time as a profession, and I'm saying as a medical profession, not surgical profession, to actually get get our heads around what we've just been through. That it's been like, oh well done, and now we're gonna go full pelt back into recovering services. And I think we're finding it much harder to try and get back to normal or a normal rather than we did with dismantling. But there's been no account to allow, particularly those in ITU who probably are gonna get an element of PTSD. And they've <laughs> given that ability to talk to, to get over that and you know it's how do we do we as a profession say no as surgeons we should support our colleagues and we should give them some time or do we have to you know look, look at the numbers of patients that are quite worrying that are waiting but there has there does feel like there's been no attempt to deal with that element of um, recovery from from particularly the ITU the intensivists and anaesthetists have been through and I do feel for them with that 
Thank you. No, I totally agree. I mean, first of all, to um to whoever wrote the, the question, you've got um my eternal thanks and gratitude. Um in my hospital, the RITU consultants and everyone who's been on the unit are unbelievably amazing. Um, and they just kind of came to work without complaint and have just dealt with this. Um, and they've been brilliant. And frankly, um, many more patients would have died if it hadn't been for their expertise and their time and their sacrifice. Um, and it's incredible. In terms of the, the, the restart, I can fully understand why people are just exhausted. And this is traditionally a time of year you know, in surgical timetables when we're actually doing a bit less, you know, some holidays, um, people are off a little bit. It's a tricky bit of time that people get to rest and we're not getting that um, because of the because of the waiting times. One of the things that I would like to see is that so through through the crisis, through the worst of it a couple of months ago, um, one of the things I was disappointed in is how relatively little joined up thinking there was between associations and colleges. Um, you'd often get one group of surgeons saying something different to another group of surgeons. You'd get some guidance from general surgeons being different to the guidance from a laparoscopic group of surgeons being different to gynecologists. And certainly very little joined up thinking between specialties. Um, and whereas various colleges produce guidance, there was actually relatively little between all of us together. And as we begin to start thinking about coming out of this, I think one of the most valuable things would be to actually have clinicians on the front line in individual hospitals working together to try and plan a way out of this. Um, secondly, I think that all too often, just as we talk about rotors, um, it needs to be the people who are ultimately going to be delivering this care who are front and centre and planning how it's going to work. And if we have people sat on trust boards or, you know, management teams who aren't necessarily at the front line of delivering this it's going to be extremely difficult and we can't simply expect the people who have been you know delivering the work and now expect to deliver the work in the future to simply do what's asked of them because of waiting times we have to ultimately realize what people have been through and come up with a set of timetables or plans that are going to be achievable and sustainable because whereas it's been difficult for the last few months and very difficult the next few months and years are not going to be any easier and i think um, any decisions made about resumption of elective practice have to be made together with our anesthetic and our intensive care colleagues to whom we will forever be grateful brilliant um Thank you. I think we should start drawing to close now um, with no more time for questions. Um, does anyone want to make any final comments? Um, it's been really interesting um, listening to everyone's viewpoints on now, the past, the future, parenthood, different sorts of families, carers, that kind of thing. Anyone want to have the last word? One of you. Oh, Vic, would you like to have the last word? Because I just wanted to say it's been brilliant having you on council. And I didn't realise you were working from home, which is um, why you've been so very, very active on council. So thank you. Can I leave you with the last word? Thank you. Yeah, I'm just delighted. I, I want to see so much change. I want to see everything change in surgery. And I am actually delighted we're doing this parenting webinar. I'm delighted that they that they, that that um, council have a, a, a voting members right registrar on council. I'm delighted that we're doing this and this conversation started. Some good things have come out of Corona because, you know, the working from home, the, the ability to have meetings over Skype. And I actually think that the, the future of surgery is getting brighter for everyone. And I and I hope that this continues and I have um, I have high hopes. So but we can all change it together if we just keep at it. <laughs> Absolutely. My parting word. Brilliant. Thank you all very much. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Good yeah, night. Thanks for